archaeologists, the first thing we need to understand about the materials that we work with is how well they preserve over time. Human bone has various properties that mean in certain circumstances it preserves well, in other circumstances it preserves badly. But broadly we can divide human bone into the mineral component, the hard stuff, and the collagen, the soft tissue component, the organic component of bone. Like most organic materials, collagen will decay over time, and it does decay more quickly than the mineral component of bone. Now, collagen within the bone, the general de decay is, is slightly retarded by the fact that it is mixed together within a sort of mineral crystal structure. But generally, when we're working with archaeological bone, we tend to find the vast majority of the collagen has decayed. That means archaeological bone is brittle, it's very rigid, it's still very hard, but it's very different than living bone. It no longer has flexibility and it can no longer respond to kind of twisting and bending forces. So over the long term, collagen loses its integrity and we're left mostly with the mineral component of bone. This means that archaeological skeletons are often very, often very fragile, they feel quite chalky, and they have the tendency to break both within the archaeological record and if we don't handle them very carefully in the lab. Excavating human remains is a long process. We have to think of it from the very beginning of when that material was deposited all the way through to at the end when we gather and analyse our data. So we start off with a reality in the past. An individual is buried or their body is deposited in one way, shape or form. Initially there's a burial bias, so not everybody that was alive at the beginning is actually buried we find in certain periods actually very, a very small proportion of people are actually being buried in archaeologically recoverable ways. This is particularly the case for the Neolithic in Britain, where we tend to find a small number of, of individuals in commingled communal tombs. They don't represent anything like the number of people that were probably alive at the time. Add to this a taphonomic bias, so the fact that some skeletons survive and some don't based on how they're treated and where they're buried, we have to acknowledge the fact that before we even excavate, a certain proportion of the people who were once alive have now been lost completely to us. We then have to think about the process of excavation, which, no matter how carefully done, still can cause some damage to the human skeletal remains. This can be in the form of actual physical damage during excavation, or in the form of selective excavation. So you may find that some sites, depending on where they are and how they're being excavated, cannot be completely recovered. So only part of the population is actually excavated in the first place. This forms our archaeological archive. So the individuals that were buried, who did survive, that we were able to excavate, that we actually have recovered and brought to the lab. We then have to consider what we can do with the methods that we have. There are some errors in the methods that we use, and I'll talk, to those, talk about those a bit more as we go through this module. And what comes out at the end is our archaeological data. So if you think about the entire process all the way through, it gives you a good idea and an understanding of what we can and can't say from human skeletal remains recovered from archaeological sites. So we're left with a few problems and a few challenges. We know that the prevailing funerary rite of the time can affect the amount of information that we can actually gather from the osteological data. And the best example of this is if we contrast periods when inhumation was common with periods when cremation is the prevailing funerary rite. It is challenging to get as much information from the analysis of a cremation as it is from an inhumation. So if, for example, we're dealing with the Bronze Age in Britain where a lot of people were cremated, there is a certain amount of data that is irretrievably lost to us. On the flip side of that, it's worth pointing out that cremated bone and indeed teeth survive a lot better in acid conditions than normal uncremated bone. So actually, if we're dealing with a period where cremation is common on acid soils, we may be able to get more information out of that context than we would if people hadn't been cremated. So the various factors are complex and can lead to quite a difficult to interpret situation. It's worth pointing out also that commingled remains, where different parts of different people are mixed together, are particularly challenging for us because, for example, if we want to determine biological sex, we may want to look at the pelvis and we may want to look at the skull. But if we don't know whose skull belongs to whose pelvis, then that's going to cause a problem. And this is a really good diagram, which basically shows you 
what you're left with at the end of this long archaeological process of loss, of selective recovery and of analysis. So realistically, the skeletons we're left with at the end are but a small snapshot of the true archaeological population. This makes them quite valuable to us and kind of necessitates the range of methods of analysis that we apply to human skeletal remains. So thinking first of all about the most basic analysis, that of recording what you actually have present. Recording the skeleton can be divided into three different processes. We record what's there, essentially completeness. We record preservation, so how well preserved the condition of what is actually there. And also fragmentation, which is simply how broken, fragmented the material is. And these three means of recording provide a detailed archive of condition of the material. This is the sort of report that would be recorded at the um, Sites and Monuments record that would go into the appendices of an osteological report. And it's the sort of thing we keep here at the university to go with all our skeletons so we know what is actually there. There are various ways of doing this. This is what you'll be doing in the practical today. You can use a table to record what is there and what isn't there. You can use a diagram to colour in what is there and what isn't there. And the diagram is actually a very, very useful tool because you can be very specific about which parts of the bones are missing or present. You can mark areas that are fragmented by using cross-hatching, for example. Or you can actually mark the exact locations of breaks. And that can form a really detailed archive. If we add to that imaging methods, radiography, photography, and new methods such as 3D scanning and 3D printing, there are a whole raft of different ways of recording and reproducing skeletal structures. And this is Richard III. Had to get him in somewhere. So why do we actually want to record this data? Apart from the fundamental archaeological requirement of providing an archive of material, we can actually explore what we have and what we don't have. We quantify what we have so we can see what we don't have and so we can examine potentially what was initially deposited in the first place. And one example of where this is particularly useful is again in the British Neolithic where we know that human remains are being manipulated after death. If you go to a Neolithic chambered tomb, you may find within one of the compartments a pile of commingled human remains. We don't know how many people that represents, nor do we know quite how they got there. And it is possible to look at the representation of different elements to understand that process. And so in this particular study, you've got a comparison of the complete skeleton, which is marked by the black line. This is what we'd expect from a complete skeleton in terms of the proportions of different parts of the body. You have a medieval cemetery in blue, which follows almost exactly the pattern of a complete skeleton. This is consistent with whole, complete skeletons, complete individuals being buried in one go and being left alone. The other three lines, the orange line, the green line and the red line, represent different Neolithic cemeteries, different um, structures. And you can see that some of these vary quite considerably from the proportion of different elements we would expect. In particular, if you look at Fuzel's Lodge, there's a very, very low representation of hand and foot bones. Now, the hand and foot bones are some of the first bones to essentially fall off the skeleton when the body decays. One potential explanation of a low proportion of hand and foot bones in an assemblage is that the bodies were actually somewhere else. They were either left to decay in another grave and removed, collected and transferred to the chambered tomb, or they may even have been excarnated, so exposed to the elements, left to decay, and then transferred once the body was completely skeletonised. So we can actually infer things about funerary practice by seeing which bones are there and which bones aren't. Essentially, preservation patterns can be very meaningful 